Wrapping up from Lent, it was awesome. All of the opportunities to learn more about Jesus, to serve our neighbors as ourselves. Now I'm going to test you a little bit. See how you do. He is risen. John, I don't think they passed. <laughs> he is risen. He is risen. That's getting better. We're going to have to practice that a little bit. But it's true. He is risen. We say he is risen, not just he has risen, but that he is alive today. And now we are going to talk about since Christ has risen, since Christ has died on the cross, he is alive. He's alive in us. What are we going to do about it? How is God calling us to live this life that now we don't have to fear death anymore? We're going to start a new sermon series on heroes of the Bible, and we're going to see their example in our lives. What does this look like? And actually, my um, iPad is running out of juice, so I think you're going to have to help me out a little bit um, on some of this, so... It'll be, it'll be awesome. It'll be wonderful. Um, the devil can't get to us. Christ is risen, so it'll be wonderful. Today I'm going to start with Ruth. Ruth is pretty cool because she is in the Old Testament, yet I think there is something about us being believers in Jesus that the story of Ruth has to tell us today. And the big, big theme, if you've ever read the book of Ruth, and if you haven't, go home tonight. I encourage you to read it. It's a nice little short little story. You can read it with your kids Mostly, I don't think they'll get some of the parts, so you'll get those parts, though, um, all about Ruth. The big theme is family. And oftentimes in our communities, when we talk about family, we're thinking marriage, right? And that's what we end up talking about a lot in our community, on TV, um, here in the church. Marriage is good. We like marriage. But did you know that family is a lot bigger than marriage. If we focused only on marriage with the story of Ruth, the story is going to get awfully depressing really, really fast. And so the first lesson that we learn about family from Ruth is that family is so much more. It's bigger. God has a big plan for the family of God, and I don't want us to miss it. I don't want us to miss out on the big plan that God has for the family of God. So let's talk about the more that God has in store for us. Well, let's remember, what is the story of Ruth? The story of Ruth is really the story of Naomi. I don't know why they call it Ruth and not Naomi. I would have called it Naomi. Naomi is a woman who lives in Bethlehem. Really, Bethlehem. This would be after the time of Moses, in the time of Judges, but before King David. So a long time ago, a long, long time ago, in Bethlehem, before Jesus. And so here the people of God, the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jewish people, they're in the land that God has given to them, the promised land. But wouldn't you know, there is a famine and so Naomi and her husband and her two sons, they're here in Bethlehem and there isn't enough food to go around to feed their family. And so they have to leave the promised land and go to a different land, a foreign land, and they go to Moab. Moab is not the land that God has given to them. Moab is a place where there's, there's other gods that people worship. There's other beliefs and other faiths, and it's not the Jews living there. They are in a foreign place, and while they're there in Moab trying to survive, Naomi's husband dies. But it's okay. She's got her two sons. So her two sons marry, and their hopes are to have a new family there in Moab, and they marry Moabite women. So again, not Jewish women, but Moabite women. But also while they're there, then Naomi's sons die. And now here we go. There are three unmarried, widowed women who don't have their husbands anymore to take care of them. They're, they're really on their own. And they could be rather hopeless and rather vulnerable. And Naomi knows this. 
So she tells her daughters-in-law, who have both lost their husbands now, uh, that they need to go back to their families and hope that because of their age, because they're young, that somebody will remarry them, that they'll have a family again, that somebody will take them into their homes and take care of them. That's the hope anyway. And so Naomi tells this to her two uh, daughter-in-laws, and Orpah, one of them, does do that. There's many tears. It's very sad, very dramatic in the Bible. But Ruth, unlike a lot of the other uh, Moabites, she kind of does something uncharacteristic, and Ruth decides to stay with Naomi wherever Naomi will go. And Naomi goes back to Bethlehem, goes back to where she grew up, and Ruth, the Moabite, goes with her there. Well, this is interesting because when they go back to Bethlehem, remember there's a famine. There isn't enough to eat. And here come these two more mouths to feed in Bethlehem. And their only hope is to basically beg. Naomi is the older one. Ruth is the younger one. So Ruth is going to go out to the fields. And in those fields, the owners have already taken all of the what little grain there is for themselves. And then they send their slaves out secondary to get food for themselves. And then the poor people come next. And the poor people are digging through these fields that have already been picked over. And they're trying to find any kind of food. And here in the midst is Ruth trying to find enough food for her and Naomi so that they don't starve and die. And Ruth is vulnerable. There's lots of other men here. Nobody's going to take care of her. She could easily be abused. But luckily God sends Boaz, an upright man who kind of sees Ruth and makes sure she's taken care of. He kind of arranges it so that other people are keeping Ruth safe as she goes and gets um, food in the fields. And then Boaz even arranges it so that there's some extra left so that Ruth can take some back to Naomi so there's enough so they don't starve. Naomi sees this. And so she encourages Ruth to encourage Boaz and to keep this good, uh, good relationship going, right? Until one day then the next of kin for Naomi is going to take what little Naomi has left, take what little land was left to her from her husband and her sons, and probably then take also Naomi and Ruth, and they'd either be slaves or concubines, um, maybe wives. We don't know what would have happened. But Boaz then steps in one more time, and he buys that land, and he takes Naomi and Ruth into his house, and he marries Ruth, and now they are a family. And, and it's really kind of cool because then Ruth and Boaz have a son named Obed, and Naomi gets to be the grandmother for their son Obed and raise him up. So she gets to be this adopted grandmother, and it gets even cooler than that because Obed's son is Jesse. And do you remember kind of this phrase that you hear sometimes, the root of Jesse? And so eventually, like 28 generations later, comes Jesus. The great, 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 great grandson is born through this line from Ruth. And Naomi gets to be a part of this. How cool is that? So grandparents, <laughs> adopted relatives into your family, aunts and uncles, you don't know the influence that you have on your family members, that God is using you in your families as well. You don't even know how God is using you yet as a, as a faithful men and women in your family. Family is more than just marriage. If we focused on only marriage in the story of Ruth, we'd be missing out on God's faithfulness to Naomi. And 1 Timothy chapter 5 reminds us and says this, that we are to encourage people who are older than us as if they are our own mothers and fathers, as if they're our own parents. We should take care of them. And we should encourage those who are younger than us as if they are our own brothers and sisters in purity. Like there are siblings, we should take care of them. No matter their ages, we are a family. Now at our 
church, Lutheran Church of the Master, we have a few places where we actually have these multi-generational opportunities and people coming together to raise each other up in a larger family unit. Um, and the one place I can really point to is confirmation. We have about 100 middle schoolers that meet here on Wednesdays between here on our other campus. And our small group leaders are a variety of people. We have a high schooler as a small group leader. We have a young adult in college as a small group leader. We have some parents who are small group leaders. We have some retired individuals as small group leaders. It is so cool to see this one place in the life of the church that is um, really bringing together people in, as the family of God that God intended. And it's pretty neat. Last night we had our eighth grade retreat. And so for those eighth graders who are looking toward um, confirmation pretty soon, we have the opportunity to sit down one-on-one, -on -one, the pastors and the students, and we kind of quiz them in the hot seat for a little bit. And I, uh, one question I like to ask is, well, someday you're going to probably hopefully, uh, move out of your parents' house, <laughs> and you're going to go to college, you're going to get married, you're going to get your first job, you're going to move away, and I'm going to want you to go to church, and your parents are going to want to, you to go to church. Why do you think you should go to church? And they always answer with the answers they think I want to hear. <laughs> because I have to worship God, because I have to keep learning about the Bible, um, because my parents want me to. All good answers. They say, yes, yes, yes. But when you go to college, I want you to join the church softball team. And I want you to be a part of a Bible study that maybe does the Bible study for five minutes and then cooks pancakes for two hours with the other guys. I want you to be a part of of a community, of a family, of other people who will be your brothers and your sisters in the name of Jesus Christ, wherever you go in the world, and for you to know that you are not alone. So others will support you um, in your life, pray for you if you need prayer. And if they need something, you will be there for them as well. You will be a family in the Lord. And that's what I encourage them. Ruth and Naomi, they become a family with each other. And then as Boaz marries Ruth, Naomi is still this family with their son Obed. And, and it's awesome. This is God's design that we would be committed to one another. And, you know, when we talk about marriage and commitment, the statistics aren't good. You hear about those statistics like 40 to 50% of marriages end in divorce. Yikes, I looked this up on the CDC, and you might not be able to read that on the screen, but I'll tell you, um, surprisingly, in the last 10 years, the divorce rate is going down. However, also on that same page, it says the marriage rate is also, in the last 10 years, going down. We have a problem with commitment in our world. We don't like commitment very much. And that brings another lesson from the story of Ruth is commitment. Commitment is so much more than just about marriage. There's more to it for people who are faithful in Jesus Christ. The Moabites were not very committed. When they moved to Moab, in Moab, they worshipped lots of different gods. They were polytheists. They didn't have to choose the one and only God. You could worship whoever you wanted in Moab. So what's really unique is that here Ruth the Moabite chooses to be committed to Naomi's one and only true God of Israel. That's commitment. Not only did she commit to Naomi as her mother-in-law and Naomi's God as her God, but she committed to moving back to the promised land, to Bethlehem, where there is a famine, where they will be um, vulnerable widows with no one to take care of, where they will be facing potential starvation or rape or death. Yikes. This is commitment that we do not understand when we have 40 to 50% of marriages ending in divorce. We don't get this kind of commitment in faith. You know who does get this kind of commitment? This kind of commitment to do anything out of love for another person is Jesus Christ. 
I read here in John chapter 19, Jesus is crucified and he is dying on the cross. And it says in John 19, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And they said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And they became a family. As Jesus is dying on the cross for them. Commitment. And now they are a family. And they don't know what's going to happen. They might be next. They don't know yet that Easter is coming. They'll see it pretty soon. They are a family in the Lord. Commitment is not just for marriage. I've heard this story more than once, actually, um, in our congregation from individuals. So maybe this is similar in your life, where um, the men of our congregation, maybe 50 years ago, they got their first job down at the phone company downtown. And there they knew nobody, but lots of people were, it was their first days, and they might be at uh, the cafeteria, brought their lunch, and so they sit down with somebody that they've just met, and they start to have a conversation, and they find out, oh they're married also and they start to talk some more and they find out oh you go to church also with your family and then they said well let's do a little devotional once a week and we can say prayer with each other over our meals and then they decide to get the families together for a barbecue where they can all say grace to each with each other and the kids grow up with one another and you know what one family might be Lutheran and the other one might be Methodist (laughs) but they are believers in Jesus Christ Christ is their unity. And the family of God is now much, much bigger than just the husband and the wife and the 3.4 kids that it was 50 years ago. I don't know how many kids it is now, but now we know we have grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and neighbors and other families encouraging one another. I don't care if you're a Lutheran or a Methodist or a Catholic or a Baptist. (laughs) We are believers in Jesus Christ, and he is our unity and commitment to one another, the family of God. There is an organization here in our town that we're a part of, Youth for Christ. It's just awesome. It's, in our, it's, it's an opportunity for our public school kids uh, to have a larger family. Um, There's many kids who don't know the name of Jesus yet, and so Youth for Christ, one of their missions is to go to those kids who don't know Jesus, and we give them opportunities to meet Jesus for the first time, to see that there is a big community out there who loves them, who's praying for them, um, who wants them to know the Lord. It's awesome. Another benefit of Youth for Christ, though, is that then our kids who, when they go to school, and then they get to see other believers in their classrooms, Maybe teachers, maybe classmates that go either to their church or the church down the street, and they know that they are not alone either. And so their church family has grown. And here, actually, in this very room on Tuesday afternoons, the elementary school down the street meets right here. And they have small groups, and there's games, and there's parents, and our youth director, Steve, is there with the kids, and they're telling them about Jesus, both kids who go to church and kids who don't go to church. And now they are the family of God. And in our East Campus, we have the West Side High School meets there for Youth for Christ. It is so cool to remember now, as Ruth and Naomi did, that family and commitment is so much bigger than what we often think about. I love in uh, 1 Timothy 5, it goes on in chapter, verse 8, it says, If anyone does not provide for your relatives, especially members of your own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Whew, that's some strong words that we are called to encourage one another. And when we remember what it said earlier, that that doesn't just mean our household, but it means all people, um, all your neighbors, the church kids that you hear running around. You're going to hear them here pretty soon out there, um, getting the last of those donuts out there, that we are the family of God for one another. My son um, started T-ball, Yesterday, he's three, they had clinic 
for a three-year-old t-ball um, where they went and they ran the bases and they hit the tee off the bat. So it was pretty cute and everything. But already next week, it'll be Sunday afternoon, 1 o'clock, and he's got uh, a meeting with the coaches and everybody's going to get together. And I know it's going to come more and more that on Sundays, the day that I think of for church, for family, for coming to worship together, it's going to get um, tight for scheduling, right? But if we are truly the body of Christ, if we are truly the family of God, then it doesn't matter if you are here on Sunday morning or if you are out on the ball field or you are at your workplace or you are at school, your family is bigger than just right here on Sunday morning. And so I encourage you, as Ruth and Naomi did, to find your family of God. Another church family whether here from our church or a different church, that you can pray with at mealtime, that you can meet together if you have to be somewhere on a Sunday morning for sports, that really quickly you can do a devotional with each other, that just your kids can grow up with one another and know that they are not alone, that there are other people praying for them, that there are other godly men and women of all ages across denominations, across the different families, to know that family is so much much bigger. When we talk about commitment, when we talk about faith, when your kids see you extending your family in Jesus Christ beyond just Sunday morning here in this church, what a witness is that going to be to them? What a testament to the saving power of Jesus Christ that you actually mean what you believe and you actually want to tell other people that they are saved by Jesus Christ also because you're practicing your faith outside of these walls with other people that you are showing your love to them as well. And your kids are going to see that. All of our kids, and not just our kids, but our neighbors of all ages. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks uh, for the joy of Jesus Christ that he committed to love us so much that he died on the cross for us, to forgive us our sins, that he rose.